P.W. Bota made countless statements, too many to cite here, attacking and criticizing South African newspapers. Norman Minoyam, an attorney who advised one of the opposition newspapers, explained the rationale behind these attacks. The government never wanted the public to know that newspapers were writing the truth about them and that the government was stopping the truth. They wanted to say, these people are lying. That's why we're censoring, not because they're telling the truth. These people are liars. Good evening. My name is Marisa Kelly. I'm the president of Suffolk University, and it is a pleasure to welcome you here to the historic modern theater and to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Tonight, we proudly continue our spring programming in what is the forum's 120th year serving Boston as the longest running free public lecture series in the United States. Fostering positive engagement in the public sphere is core to who we are. And perhaps now more than ever, there is a need for Suffolk University to bring this historic strength to bear in fostering civil dialogue and freedom of the press, which is so critical to the health of our democracy. It is for this reason that I am especially proud to be part of tonight's Ford Hall Forum, because this is, of course, exactly the issue upon which we are focused this evening. Tonight, in our program, The Enemy of the People, Freedom of the Press and Democracy, our speakers will examine the Boston Globe's response to President Trump's efforts to discredit the media. The Globe mobilized editorial boards of all political orientations across the country to argue that a free press is essential for sustaining democracy. This conversation tonight will situate the Globe's initiative within the Ford Hall Forum's long tradition of promoting the free expression of ideas. Uh, I know it's customary for uh, speakers to begin their talk by saying, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be here this evening. But <laughs> for those who know the rich history of Ford Hall Forum, uh, I think you'll know I'm very sincere when I say, I am honored to be here this evening. And I would even add humbled to be here this evening. Um, uh, so the order of the presentation, I'm going to talk for about 20 or 25 minutes. Marjorie will come up, she'll talk. We'll have a little conversation amongst ourselves and then we will open the floor to questions. Um, when Susan Spurlock asked if I was interested in addressing Ford Hall Forum, based on my recently published book on opposition journalists in apartheid South Africa. I reflected on how I could use this remarkable opportunity. I wanted to find a meaningful link between my research, which focused on journalists trying to circumvent censorship and promote democracy, and our current political moment. Why? Because our democratic values are currently under assault in a way that, frankly, I never thought possible. Tonight, instead of confining my comments specifically to my book, I'd like instead to focus more broadly on democracy. Specifically, I'd like to do the following. Examine the crucial link that exists between free speech and democracy. Honor and celebrate those who have fought so courageously to achieve democracy and to expand democracy. And finally, honor and celebrate those institutions, such as Ford Hall Forum and the Boston Globe, that have played and continue to play such a vital role in helping to sustain our democracy. I'd like to begin with the inspiring struggle of women to earn the right to vote in our country, a right they earned after seven long decades of exhaustive and exhausting political struggle. It was a movement filled with moments of soaring inspiration, as well as heartbreak and frustration. Alice Paul and other suffragettes were arrested for picketing outside the White House and exercising their First Amendment to free speech. When she was in prison, Paul went on hunger strike and authorities intervened by engaging in the physically painful and traumatic act of force feeding. By the time Margaret Sanger was invited to address Fort Hall Forum in 1929, <coughs> women had earned the right to vote, but they still lacked a fundamental basic right namely 
the right to control their own bodies. Unwanted and unplanned pregnancies took a devastating toll, limiting opportunities for women, adversely affecting their health, and in some instances, causing women to die. In her role as a nurse in New York City, Margaret Sanger observed this suffering firsthand and became an early and ardent supporter of what she termed birth control. She was regularly harassed and even arrested for her activities. Fort Hall Forum extended an invitation to Sanger to allow her to share her views on birth control to an audience in Boston. James Curley, the mayor of Boston at the time, referred to Sanger's work as child murder propaganda and banned Sanger from addressing Fort Hall Forum when he learned of the invitation. You may rightly ask at this point, given the protections of the First Amendment, how was it possible for a politician to ban someone from speaking, even if her views were considered radical at the time? I'll return to that issue at the conclusion of my remarks, but for now it is important to note that Curley's ban at the time had the force of law and had Sanger overtly violated this ban and openly addressed Ford Hall Forum, she would have been subject to arrest and imprisonment. Sanger's solution? She stood on stage with a gag over her mouth while Arthur Schlesinger Sr., a professor at Harvard, read her remarks. Here is an excerpt. You all know that I have been gagged. I have been suppressed. I have been arrested numerous times. I have been hauled off to jail. Yet every time, more people have listened to me. More have protested. More have lifted their voices. Sanger's response was an inspired act of resistance. She technically complied with the ban, but by standing on stage with a gag over her mouth while Schlesinger read her words, she also drew attention to and ridiculed the ban. Opposition journalists in South Africa in the late 1980s used precisely the same tactic. One of the apartheid government's many tools of oppression included banning individuals, and once individuals were banned, they could not be quoted in the media. The journalist solution, have those who were not banned summarize the comments and speeches of those who were. Joe Slovo, for example, the leader of the South African Communist Party, had been banned for decades and was living in exile. A Weekly Mail article written at the time read, since Joe Slovo is banned and may not be quoted, we asked Tom Lodge, an authority on the ANC and the SACP, to assess the speech. After a brief introduction, Lodge writes, in summary, what Slovo had to say was this, and he then proceeded to summarize Slovo's entire speech. <laughs> Anti-apartheid journalists, of course, would not have been aware that Margaret Sanger had used a similar tactic when addressing a Ford Hall Forum audience in 1929. That, however, is precisely what makes this tactic so compelling. It reveals the ingenuity, the innovation, and the creativity of those determined to express ideas that others seek to silence. In addition to the fact that this tactic allows individuals to convey information that otherwise would have been banned, it conveyed a powerful symbolic message as well. Governments may have the power to silence individuals, but silencing ideas is considerably more challenging, particularly ideas as powerful as the right of a woman to control her own body and the need to abolish apartheid, a system the United Nations described as a crime against humanity. After Sanger's appearance, Ford Hall Forum subsequently invited a number of speakers who spoke about a variety of pressing issues, including many who specifically addressed the issue of racial injustice in the United States. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Maya Angelou, Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, Jesse Jackson. Some of these speakers, such as Malcolm X, would have been quite controversial at the time. That, however, was precisely the point. Ford Hall Forum is an institution that allows people to express ideas that may or may not be popular. But they have a right to express their views, and they have a right to do so without being interrupted heckled or attacked. When Fort Hall Forum speakers complete their presentations, 
Audiences then have a chance to ask questions, as you will this evening. In a very real way, Ford Hall Forum, oops, sorry about that, <laughs> promotes the values and ways of interacting with one another that are essential for democracy. In addition to inviting speakers to promote racial justice in the United States, Fort Hall Forum also invited two speakers seeking to advance racial justice in apartheid South Africa, dissident Afrikaner cleric Bayers Nuday and Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu. For students in the audience who may not have learned much about apartheid in high school, apartheid refers to the system of racial segregation in South Africa. White South Africans, who represented less than 20% of the overall population by the mid-1980s, consisted of those of British descent, as well as a group called Afrikaners, mostly of Dutch descent. Afrikaners speak the language Afrikaans, and apartheid, pronounced apartheid in Afrikaans, literally means apartness. When I teach about apartheid, I always refer to the system of segregation in this country as a touchstone. Consider the massive levels of violence the white majority in this country use to maintain the system of segregation. Now try to imagine the levels of violence necessary for a white minority in South Africa to maintain a system of segregation that was in many ways even more restrictive than the United States. By 1985, South Africa was in a state of crisis. Resistance to apartheid by black South Africans was sweeping the country. The international community was applying massive economic and political pressure on the South African government to reform. And the apartheid government openly, openly defied calls for meaningful change and instead declared martial law. It was truly a terrifying situation. The white minority government possessed without question the most formidable military on the African continent, including access to Mirage jets as well as nuclear weapons. An interesting fact, South Africa was the first country in the history of the world to voluntarily give up nuclear weapons when Nelson Mandela was elected president. And it was attempting to maintain control over approximately 85% of the population, a conflict that could lead to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, even millions, seemed entirely possible. It was in this context that Ford Hall Forum invited Bayers Nuday and Desmond Tutu to speak. Bears New Day addressed an audience in Old South Church, and Desmond Tutu addressed an audience at Northeastern University. I want to start with Desmond Tutu's address first. Tutu, the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984, was the most prominent anti-apartheid activist in South Africa who had not been banned, detained, or assassinated by the government. In his address, Tutu expressed his sincere gratitude particularly to the college students, for the role that they were playing to pressure the US government to impose economic sanctions on South Africa. President Obama has noted on several occasions that his first political experience was his participation in the sanctions movement as a college student. As president, Obama would one day honor Desmond Tutu at the White House. Fort Hall Forum recorded the speech Tutu made that day on May 13th, 1988. We have access to that clip, uh, to that speech, and we'll listen to a brief clip now. And while we do, I'm going to show photographs uh, from South Africa at that time, including from the photographer Peter Magubani, who's considered one of the great uh, photographers of South Africa. But it is a very, very great privilege to be here and thank you for this honor bestowed on me. I am fully aware that it is an honor bestowed to me in a representative capacity and as a representative I am greatly honored to receive it, for I know that I receive it on behalf of so many, many others who have paid a very heavy price for the audacity of thinking and claiming 
that they were human. They have paid some the ultimate price of laying down their lives. Others, such as those whom we regard as our authentic leaders, the Nelson Mandela's, the Walter Sisulu's, and many, many others, languish in jail because they had the audacity to say, hey, we are human too. And our dignity is not in the gift of this or that other human being. Certainly not in the gift of white people. It is something that is inalienable. It comes in the package of being human. Hundreds of thousands of pages have been written about apartheid. I contributed 300. <laughs> In this two minute clip, Desmond Tutu, like a poet, captures the essence of the anti-apartheid struggle. In many ways, the anti-apartheid movement was staggeringly complex, but the impulse animating it was profoundly, strikingly simple. Black South Africans are human beings. And in the words of Tutu, their dignity is not in the gift of this or that other human being, certainly not in the hands of white people. It is inalienable. It comes in the package of being human. Bayer's New Day, the other speaker invited by Ford Hall Forum, may not be as familiar to many here tonight as Desmond Tutu. New Day and Afrikaner had been a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church, which claimed that apartheid was sanctioned by the Bible. New Day disagreed. According to one source, quote, after completing his last sermon in which he placed the authority of God before the authority of man, he removed his robes and left his church. New Day and his family were completely ostracized by their fellow Afrikaners. He told his wife, whatever happens, we will be together and God will be with us. Compared to black South Africans, white South Africans who opposed apartheid had a certain degree of protection because of their skin <coughs> color. But for Afrikaners, this was more complicated. The national party, the political party of apartheid, was primarily an Afrikaner-based party. And the group identity of Afrikaners is intense. In fact, some Afrikaners refer to themselves as the white tribe of Africa. For a fellow Afrikaner to challenge their community, or worse, to leave it, was the ultimate betrayal. Amrit Manga, a journalist who worked for the opposition newspaper New Nation, shared with me some of the many stories he was not able to publish because of the censorship restrictions. One included a friend of his, an Afrikaner woman, who had been detained for her activities as a union organizer and had been raped, according to Manga, repeatedly. He explained, there were white cops that would go in there and say, you've sold out. You've gone to the other side. New Day had indeed gone to the other side. And he paid a very high personal price for doing so. According to one source, quote, the Afrikaners so detested him that at his own mother's funeral, his kin locked arms to prevent him from standing at her graveside. The apartheid government temporarily revoked New Day's passport in 1972 so that he could not deliver speeches abroad. And in 1977, the government banned him. He was not allowed to leave his home, nor was he allowed to talk with more than one person at a time. He was banned for seven years. New Day addressed the Ford Hall Forum on October 27, 1985. Here's the flyer that was used to promote his talk when Filene still existed. <laughs> I received the audio of New Day's speech weeks before I received Tutu's address, and I realize it's cliche to say that one felt chills when hearing something powerful, but hearing New Day's speech 
had a physical effect on me. Hearing his voice and that wonderful Afrikaner accent was certainly one factor. But I think it also had to do with the fact that when I listened to his speech, I knew so much that Bayer's New Day did not know that fall day in Boston in 1985. He did not know the horrifying levels of violence that would, what, that would take place over the next five years in South Africa, the apartheid government's use of death squads, the number of people killed by police, the massive number of people tortured and raped in detention. He did not know that after five years of these nightmare levels of violence, the world would witness one of the most stirring and moving images of the 20th century, Nelson Mandela, after 27 years in prison, walking free. He did not know that black South Africans would vote for the first time in their lives in 1994, when the country held its first democratic election. And that Nelson Mandela, who was in prison when New Day gave his speech, would be elected president with close to two thirds of the vote. He did not know that during Mandela's presidency, South Africa would establish the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Rather than imprison and execute members of the former apartheid regime, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission allowed them to apply for amnesty if they came forward to confess their crimes publicly and truthfully. He did not know that his dear friend Desmond Tutu would chair that Reconciliation Commission. And I had to pick one photo to capture their friendship. And I just love this one so much. But I also found this one under the headline, <laughs> The Coolest Selfie on the Internet. <laughs> New Day did not know that he would live a very long life and that his children would give him grandchildren and his grandchildren would give him great-grandchildren. And he did not know that towards the end of his very long life, he would require a wheelchair and that one day he would be pushed in that wheelchair by President Mandela. All of this Bayer's New Day did not know when he addressed Ford Hall Forum in 1985. The brief clip I'm about to play comes towards the end of his speech. Up to this point, New Day has not displayed significant emotion, but rather has provided a sober, systematic overview of the extremely bleak situation in apartheid South Africa at that time. I know this may sound very depressing to you. I hope it doesn't sound sensational, because I don't want to be sensational. I don't want to be melodramatic. I'm too concerned about the future of the country. I'm too concerned about the concept of justice. I'm too much concerned about the role which we have to play in order to minimize violence and to bring about peace. And I say this not only for the sake of the blacks who are suffering so deeply. I'm saying this also for the sake of the whites. I'm a white. I'm an Afrikaner. I don't deny my Afrikanerdom. I understand why my people are doing this. I don't agree with that. I totally and I utterly disagree. But I thank God that I don't hate them for what they are doing. I hate the system, yes. I hate the injustice. I hate the oppression. I hate the racism. Because I believe it dehumanizes the oppressor even more than the oppressed. But having said that, I cannot stand aside and silently view a country being led to a situation of suicide and revolution. And therefore, and with that I wish to close, the question arises, what can be done in South Africa? I believe that there is very little hope that the whites will, of their own volition, change the situation. I believe we have got to face the fact that there will be the ongoing pressures on the part of the blacks until the situation, both economically and otherwise, forces the white community eventually to say we cannot continue with what we're doing, what we've done up to now. And in closure, I think it is important to try and answer, I say try and answer the question, what is there that you as people of the United States could possibly do. First of all, I would like to say that I believe that it is absolutely essential that you continue to pressurize also your own government 
in order to apply more meaningful forms of disinvestment on our country. And why I'm saying this? I'm saying this in the face of the fact that I know that I could be charged for saying this. But I'm saying this, friends, because this is one of the last peaceful measures remaining to us in order to avoid a conflict of violence and bloodshed in our country. It is only when especially the white community begin to feel in their own pockets what it means in order to pay that price that they will begin to sit up and to say, we have to reconsider what is happening. There is much to comment on in this clip, the powerful emotion in Uday's voice, the strong language that he uses. But I would like to focus on the statement Uday makes when he calls on Americans to apply economic pressure on South Africa. I'm saying this in face of the fact that I know I could be charged for saying this. It's a remarkable statement. While Uday did not know the future of his country that I previously described, he did know this. In addition to the fact that Fort Hall Forum was recording his speech, he would have known that members of the apartheid security forces were in the audience and that they were either recording or taking notes on his speech. Moreover, he would have known that a report of his speech would be delivered to the highest levels of the South African government, almost certainly to the president of South Africa himself. And yet, after having been banned for seven years, Nuday not only expressed his hatred for apartheid, but called upon citizens in the most powerful country in the world to engage in a course of action that constituted the single biggest threat to the apartheid government. Conducting research on people like New Day and the opposition journalists who I researched, um, who assumed such incredible risks when the prospect for success was so low, uh, has really and truly been a source of inspiration over the years. I've asked myself countless times, I don't know how they had the courage to do that. I've asked myself countless times, would I have had the courage to do that? Um, I was gonna read a long quote from you from Vaclav Havel about the nature of hope, but I'm mindful of the time and I do wanna get to Marjorie. But really and truly, some of the most remarkable uh, and stunningly courageous people I've had the privilege uh, to be with in my entire life. At the beginning of my talk, I said that I wanted to make a meaningful connection between my research and conditions in the United States today. One significant connection, the ways in which the apartheid government and President Trump publicly and constantly attacked the media. Apartheid officials, including P.W. Bota, made countless statements, too many to cite here, attacking and criticizing South African newspapers. Norman Minoyam, an attorney who advised one of the opposition newspapers, explained the rationale behind these attacks. The government never wanted the public to know that newspapers were writing the truth about them and that the government was stopping the truth. They wanted to say, these people are lying. That's why we're censoring, not because they're telling the truth. These people are liars. President Trump does not have the power to censor. Why then does he attack the press? He revealed his reasons off camera to Leslie Stahl when she interviewed him for 60 minutes. She asked him why he continued to attack the media even though he had won the election. Here's Leslie Stahl on his response. He said, you know why I do it? I do it to discredit you all and demean you all. So when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. Let me repeat that last part. So when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. General Colin Powell, in an interview he gave with Fareed Zakari on CNN, expressed his extreme frustration with Trump's approach to the media. Powell explained, and when I, when I read it in this kind of animated voice, I'm not trying to mimic Powell, but you know when he talks, he's a kind of cool customer. He doesn't express much emotion. And he's clearly irritated at this part of the interview. My favorite three words in our Constitution are the first three words, we the people, we the people. But recently, it's become me the president as opposed to we the people. And you see things that should not be happening. How can a president of the United States get up and say that the media is the enemy of Americans? Has he read the First Amendment? You're not supposed to like everything the press says or what anyone says. That's why we have a First Amendment, to protect that kind of speech. 
And this brings me to a very important point that I would like to make this evening. The First Amendment, as we have seen, has not always served to protect speech throughout our history. Floyd, Abr Floyd Abrams, a, prof a law professor at Yale University and a leading authority on the First Amendment, writes in his book, The Soul of the First Amendment, quote, until well into the 20th century, censorship was rampant. It was as if the First Amendment had yet to be written. Abrams provides countless examples to support his claim. Consider just one that he mentions, the Espionage Act. For those in the audience tonight who may have lived through and perhaps participated in the protests against the Vietnam War, I'm looking at you, Fred Marchand, it is jarring to consider that speaking out against the US involvement in World War I was not just unpopular, it was illegal. The socialist Eugene Debs, who vehemently criticized the war, was charged by the US government for violating the Espionage Act. At his trial, Debs said, I believe in free speech, in war as well as in peace. If the Espionage Act stands, then the Constitution of the United States is dead. In Debs' case, unfortunately, the Espionage Act stood. Debs was found guilty, sentenced to 10 years in prison, and served a two and a half year sentence at a federal penitentiary for making critical statements about World War I that are obvious to us today. Alice Paul was arrested for picketing the White House to promote the right of women to vote. Margaret Sanger was banned for promoting the idea that a woman should be able to control her own body. The words of the First Amendment have existed since 1789, but the protection offered by the First Amendment, as we understand it today, is relatively recent from a historical perspective. We will now hear from Marjorie Pritchard, who realized that we cannot take the First Amendment for granted, and when it was attacked, she and hundreds of journalists across the country acted to defend it. Marjorie and her fellow journalists are not the enemies of the people. On the contrary, by providing American citizens with facts and information, and by holding those in power accountable, regardless of political affiliation, they play an essential role in preserving democracy for we, the people. Ladies and gentlemen, Marjorie Richard. Tonight, I would like to share with you the most remarkable experience of my career. It was a simple idea, a kind of crowdsourcing that went viral. It happened in response to the president's stepped up attacks on the media, calling us the enemy of the people. And we found there was a deep passion and concern just waiting to be tapped. It began on a Tuesday, August 6th. The Globe's editorial board began to reach out to other boards around the country to see if they would write their own editorials on a free press that we would all run on the same day. In our pitch, we said, a free press looks different in Boise than it does in Boston. Our words will differ, but at least we can agree such attacks are alarming. Within a week, more than 200 publications signed up. That number quickly grew to more than 300. And when we went to press on August 16th, just 10 days after our pitch, 429 publications had joined together to defend the role of a press in our democracy. They were big city dailies, small rural weeklies, liberal, conservative, from every state in the nation. In the end, we collectively spoke intelligently and honestly, a deep and broad counterpunch to a president who feels it politically expedient to label the press the enemy and any news he does not like is fake. Although it may seem absurd in the world's leading democracy that the free press would even need to be defended, we had to do it, and we still have to do it. We have been under continual verbal assault, and by extension, so is one of the fundamental pillars of democracy. In the ongoing battle for our credibility, the president's rhetoric is taking a toll. In a poll published just before our Free Press Initiative, 48% of Republicans said that they considered the press the enemy of the people. More than one quarter of Americans said they believed the president should have the authority to close news outlets engaged in bad behavior. The president may have deemed 
this collective effort to defend the First Amendment bad behavior. Not so the US Senate. Hours after the publication of the editorials, the Senate unanimously passed a resolution introduced by Brian Schatz of Hawaii and Minority Leader Chuck Schumer expressing its support for the media. And right on cue, Trump went on the attack in a series of tweets. The Globe is in collusion with other papers on the free press. Prove it. I never did determine what he meant by prove it. <laughs> but this was not collusion. This was an act of solidarity. It was the press wanting its voice to be heard in the public discourse. The president also tweeted, there's nothing that I want more for our country than true freedom of the press. The fact is that the press is free to write and say anything it wants, but much of what it says is fake news, pushing a political agenda or just plain trying to hurt people. Honesty wins. In truth, Honesty had one of its best days of the year when those 429 publications stood tall. It made all of us in journalism proud. I could only hope that before the president started tweeting that he took time to read the essays because he would have learned that journalists all over the nation aren't the enemy. We're fellow citizens doing our jobs. The collection of editorials provides a glimpse into how dedicated journalists are to the truth to their communities and holding the powerful accountable. I'd like to share with you a few examples. This one is from Michigan Live Media Group. We aren't the enemy of the people, we are the people. Time and time again in Michigan, we've seen the power of the relationship between the press and the public. Without that relationship, Flint might still be drinking water from the Flint River with no one the wiser. Larry Nasser likely would still be seeing patients at Michigan State University. Another example is from the Hartford Current. Is this really what the enemy looks like? Sitting in court, rushing off to par car and plane crashes, listening to grieving families, sifting through masses of government documents, checking facts, calling people back, checking facts again? That's the life of your typical journalist. The editorial went on. The reality of daily journalism, the journalism that makes a difference, is that it is mainly about showing up, about listening. It's because words matter, truth matters, because a story can change a life. This one is from the Star News in Wilmington, North Carolina. We are people who, like you, have a stake in our communities. We are your neighbors. We are people who live and work in the same towns as you. We send our children to local schools. We sing in the church choir. We struggle to pay our bills. We have relatives serving in the armed forces. We love America. The president's attacks have also emboldened local politicians around the country to adopt his mantra, calling any coverage that they don't like as fake news. And instead of cooling his rhetoric, Trump has doubled down. In a page straight out of George Orwell's 1984, he told the Veterans of Foreign Wars annual national convention last summer, quote, don't believe the crap you see from these people, the fake news. What you are seeing and what you are reading, it's not what's happening. President Trump isn't the first president who hasn't liked press coverage. John Adams, who once said, the liberty of the press is essential to the security of freedom, signed the Sedition Act in 1798 that made, a, made it illegal to publish criticism of the US government. Woodrow Wilson used propaganda and censorship to control the press. Richard Nixon despised the press. He went so far as to compile an enemies list, which included the Globe's venerated reporter, Marty Nolan, and columnist George Frazier, who upon learning that he was on the list, quipped, I thought he'd never ask. <laughs> Barack Obama routinely spied on the press and prosecuted journalists. He set the record for denying the most freedom of information requests. So Donald Trump is not alone in having an uneasy relationship with the media. But his labeling of the press as the enemy is alarming. Journalists aren't the enemy of the people. As Marty Baron of the Washington Post has said, we are not at war, we're at work. Trump's use of the phrase enemy of the people has been used throughout history to justify the killings of millions in Rome, in Nazi Germany, in the Soviet Union, in China. 
Today, that germ, as well as fake news, is emboldening dictators and authoritarians from around the world. In Syria, after an Amnesty International report said that up to 13,000 people had been executed in a military prison between 2011 and 2015, President Bashar Assad dismissed the report, saying, we are living in a fake news era. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro responded to media reports of the horrific humanitarian crisis in his country with, the media spreads lots of false versions, lots of lies. This is what we call fake news today, isn't it? There have been similar responses in Russia, China, Uganda, Angola, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Turkey, as well as others. This rhetoric can put journalists in danger. Already it's an increasingly dangerous job. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, 251 reporters were imprisoned in 2018. At least 53 were killed for doing their jobs, including five at the Capitol Gazette in Maryland, killed by a gunman with a vendetta against the paper. They were Rob Hyacin, Wendy Winters, Gerald Fishman, John McNamara, Rebecca Smith. There was also the grisly murder of Washington Post contributing columnist Jamal Khashoggi at the hands of the Saudi government, killed for holding the government accountable. But holding governments accountable is what a free press does. The founding fathers envisioned the notion of checks and balances and the president's use of derogatory terms in response to anything he just doesn't like puts journalists at risk. Indeed, the Globe received a series of threatening phone calls over our free press initiative. After a news story was published about our effort, we began to receive threatening phone calls, referring to us as the enemy of the people. The Globe took these threats seriously and consulted with local law enforcement, which maintained a police presence in the building. On August 16th, the day the editorials were published, the caller said, and I want to share with you his exact words, you're the enemy of the people, and we're going to kill every fucking one of you. I'm going to shoot you in the fucking head later today at 4 o'clock. On August 30th, Robert Shane of Encino, California was arrested in his home. The FBI seized 20 guns, including a semi-automatic gun, as well as hundreds of rounds of ammunition. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston charged Shane with maintaining threatening communications and in interstate commerce. Outside federal court after his arrest, Chain told reporters, there's no free press in America. Yeah, I'm making a statement. The United States got saved by having Donald J. Trump elected as president. Now take a hike, you bozos. In October, pipe bombs were sent to prominent Democrats as well as CNN. Some of the Democrats who received the bombs have been frequently criticized by president. The president also often calls out CNN when he rails against the fake news media. The Free Press Initiative was a collective defense of a constitutionally enshrined pillar of democracy. An attack on the press is an attack on democracy itself. <clears throat> Defending the Constitution shouldn't be controversial. Indeed, one can support the president and his policies and also support the role of a free press they are not mutually exclusive. The nation's founding fathers knew the importance of a free press and protected it in the First Amendment. As the Globe wrote in our free press editorial, the greatness of America is dependent on the role of a free press to speak the truth to the powerful. To label the press the enemy of the people is as un-American as it is dangerous to the civic compact we have shared for more than two centuries. Thank you. We'd like to open it up to questions now. Um, there are, there's a microphone here, and we ask if you have a question, if you come to the microphone and pose the question to Brian, Marjorie, or both. Don't be shy. No. So speaking of apartheid, uh, the apartheid state of Israel uses military censorship to uh, extensively suppress uh, reports uh, from the occupied territories. They go much farther than that. 
they arbitrarily detain and uh, incarcerate uh, Palestinian journalists according to the Palestinian Committee on Prisoners. There's now currently 21 uh, Palestinian journalists uh, in uh, administrative detention, which is indefinite and uh, without charges. Uh, so this is a story that also is uh, voluntarily suppressed oftentimes in the American so-called free press as well. Uh, should we be pressuring our own government to uh, de- uh, de-invest in uh, this uh, oppressive regime, this oppressive uh, apartheid regime in Israel uh, that uh, continues to uh, not only persecute Palestinian uh, journalists but uh, many other Palestinians whose stories aren't told because of this uh, persecution of their journalists? I think that's a hugely important question. The focus of this panel though is First Amendment, freedom of speech and so forth. I was mentioning you know, divestment in terms of the pressures being put on our government with South Africa, but tonight is really about, I think, focusing on freedom of the press, freedom of speech and so forth. Do I think people have the right to engage and mobilize to put pressure on the American government? Absolutely, yes. And do you, do you think the American press has really been uh, fair in its uh, so-called uh, uh, responsibilities as a free press uh, to representing uh, Palestinian uh, interests and uh, the situation uh, within the occupied territories, or is it too much beholden to uh, the Israel state? I think that the press it does cover all sides of the issue. Um, it depends on what's in the news, but certainly, yes, I think I think they do. Mm -hmm. Are you? Uh, Are there other questions? Uh, well, you know, one of the things I really liked about your comments is that you talked about the fact that other administrations have had a tense relationship with the press. I mean, that's built into the relationship. That you're, not, you're not supposed to like one another. Uh, and you mentioned, I think, some important uh, facts about President Obama and the, the book I referred to by Floyd Abrams. You know, I, as much as I respect Obama in many ways, he was, he was quite tough with the press, yes? Yes, he was. And so I guess the thing is, while every administration prior to Trump has had an uneasy relationship, this is something fundamentally different. Yes, presidents in the past have had uneasy relationships. They, they certainly don't like the coverage. I mean, you know, it's, a lot of it is holding them accountable. Um, but at the end of the day, they had a respect for the institution. They knew that it was enshrined in the, the Constitution. It's part of our democracy. Um, and so they were, th th there was that kind of, okay, this is, what, this is, part, this is part of what happens. Um, I don't find that that is happening right now. Um, President Trump does not respect the, the, in the institution at all mm -hmm. um, and is trying to tear it down. Can I ask, I mean, is there another question? Would you like to ask a question? Well, just real, real quickly, um, you know, this issue to the extent that you, you feel comfortable, you know, sharing with the audience, when you were getting those threatening phone calls, uh, someone coming saying that they're going to kill you, uh, this happened about two or three months after the five journalists in Maryland were killed down in the Capitol Gazette. How scary was it to be at the Boston Globe in those days? What steps did you take? Uh, is that fear still pervasive amongst the Globe, other journalists? What is the sense in terms of violence? We took, we took that seriously. I mean, there were a number of phone calls that came in and they, were, they used the same language that the president used, so we felt, we felt they were serious. We consulted with local you know, law enforcement. They had, a, they had a police presence in the building. Um, the building where the Globe is downtown is already a very safe building. But uh, journalists uh, all around the country, are, I think mm -hmm. they are on high alert. Um, there are now training sessions um, on security in, in some of the smaller newspapers and some of the larger ones, too. Um, one of the... Uh, in one of the editorials that was part of the Free Press Initiative um, from Illinois, the, the writer said that she sits close to an exit when she's covering something, mm -hmm. and that whenever the office door opens at the newspaper, she looks up to see if anybody is suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, I think journalists are on high alert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Your question? Um, I just want to say thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we all really appreciate it. 
Um, so considering under the Trump administration, I'd say the press is probably under much more scrutiny than previously in terms of false reporting and mistaking in reporting. Um, could you expand upon that in terms of like, you know, we were able to see a little bit of like the BuzzFeed, um, you know, situation. Uh, and can you just expand upon, you know, the kind of scrutiny that the press is under now more so than? A tremendous amount of scrutiny. I mean, the BuzzFeed, there's, there is fake news out there. Mm -hmm. There is. I mean, there are, there are people who sit on their computers and try to, you know, distribute fake news. Um, but I think what you have to do as an individual reader is to kind of go a little bit deeper. Um, you know, look at the headline, look where it's coming from. Uh, take take the initiative to find out whether this is fake news or not, because it will just it, it, it's out there and it will get worse. I think we'll see a lot more of it as the uh, president presidential election unfolds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're asking a really important question because journalists do make mistakes, right? And I'm trying to think of another profession that exists where we hold people to 100% you know, accuracy all the time and never making any kind of mistakes. Doctors make mistakes, lawyers make mistakes, professors make mistakes, and in this hypercharged environment, when that mistake is made, sometimes legitimate mistakes, uh, Trump really then seizes and pounces and holds that up. He's obviously picking one or two examples that are legitimate mistakes, but he's not mentioning all the other things that the press is getting right. So I think that's one of the things that's so toxic about this kind of rhetoric, is it's holding up journalists to a level of perfection that no one can meet and no one ever will meet. Are there other questions? My question about, uh, it, it refers to, Marjorie, what you said, an alarming statistic that nearly half of Republicans don't believe in, 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 in the news and that a quarter of Americans support this idea of, of, of fake news. Um, how do we move forward? What do we do? I mean, Fort Hall Forum is sponsored by a, an institution of higher learning. Um, what do we do as a society? What do we do as institutions of higher learning to move forward, uh, to, to understand facts, you know, um, to be good consumers of information? Mm -hmm. What should we be doing? Uh, you know, one editorial wouldn't make a difference. 429 editorials would make a difference, but it's a start. Um, I think we're finding people are thinking that this is a problem. I think you see that in the, the U.S. Senate resolution. Um, after Jamal Khashoggi was killed and our president did not um, acknowledge that, the Senate came out with another, rela another resolution. Um, we have we had the Washington Post ad during the, the Super Bowl talking about the freedom of the press and the importance of it. Uh, the publisher of the New York Times uh, met with the president in August and again last week and voiced his concerns again about, about the rhetoric. Uh, so I think there is an awareness and I think that we could cons keep the conversation going in the classrooms uh, I also think that there's a lot of um, confusion about about how how journalism works. Mm -hmm. You know, the difference between an editorial page and a news. It gets all kind of mumbled up, but there there is a difference. And I think I think if if people know what that is, they can then start to make their own decisions about about what the what the issues are. But it's a con it's a conversation. Can I, can I jump in? I, I think you're asking a hugely important question. And one of the things that really concerns me, and I don't have the answer, is I'm guessing of the one in four Americans who said that they would favor censoring the press, I'm guessing they're not in this room. And those are the people that I want to be talking to. I, I mean, if you're coming out on a Wednesday night in February with something with the First Amendment, of course you support the First Amendment, right? So we get up here and we talk about how important the First Amendment is. Maybe, you know, we've educated you a little bit in terms of, well, I, I thought the First Amendment protections ran deeper in our history. You know, I learned something new. But one of the things that really um, I'm stumped by is this polarization in our society 
um, that also is then just reinforced by the polarized media, right? Um, people who are the one in four who support censoring the press, they're not gonna be reading the Boston Globe. They're not gonna be reading the New York Times. They're not gonna be reading the Washington Post. Um, I don't know how to bridge that gap. I love forums like the Ford Hall Forum. Uh, but again, I'm gonna guess that the 48% of people who said that the press is the enemy of the people and who support censorship are not in this room tonight. So I don't mean to end on a kind of depressing note because we want to inspire, but I don't. But you I, did. I, I don't. <laughs> But I don't know. But I mean, I do think I do think institutions of higher learning help, right? I mean, so maybe some kids are coming out of these families whose parents or grandparents might be responding to the poll that, hey, we should ban the press. And maybe people who come to contexts like this and take journalism classes and come to Fort Hall Forum can, around the Thanksgiving dinner table, say, well, actually, you know, the press does a pretty good job. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe that's how we reach those other people is by reaching the young people. But I think, you know, you're, you're asking a good and, and a hard question. One of the things that scares me most, and I don't really know the answer to this, how long term are these effects of Trump? Is this right here and right now? And that when Trump goes, you know, we get back to normal and people respect the press and we have civil discourse? I hope. I hope. I, I think you, you, you hit upon something about uh, younger people. Um, I, I think we have to get back to a basic trust. Uh, as I, I said in my remarks, you can support the president. I, half the country does. Yeah. That's fine. Um, yeah. And you can also support the importance of the freedom of the press. It's in our Constitution. They, that you could, they could live in the same world. Um, and I think if we can, we can start having that conversation with the younger people and just get our trust back. Look, the, the press isn't perfect. I mean, it's, it, it, it should be criticized for things, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's gone to a, a step. Okay. Is there another question? Mm -hmm. Sir? You know, there's some, uh, there's great institutions like the Boston Globe, the New York Times, um, but there's also Breitbart, there's Alex Jones, there's this whole problem of social media. Given that, the, you know, as you point out, 48% is unlikely to be here tonight, how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you regain the, um, the ear of more of the people like we had when there were, you know, basically three channels? back in the, in the 60s? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, isn't, but isn't that the critical, isn't Absolutely. that a critical question? The, it you know, social question. media, uh, people at their computers, the, the, it's, a, it's a world that we need to figure out how to, to tap into to, in order to get it, to get, to get some common ground. Um, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, because it becomes circular. People just go into their own little worlds right. and they don't want to come out. Um, do you have an idea? <laughs> <laughs> do you have an idea? Um, one of the, but one of the things that strikes me about your question is that when people talk about the media, it's almost a meaningless term. Because the media runs from everything from a New Yorker article that is fact-checked like by 18 people before they publish everything to this over here, and it gets lumped into the media. You know, I, I, I dislike the media, I distrust the media. Uh, but who, who are they referring to within that? I mean, there's a huge range within that category of the media. What I think we need to do is try to cultivate more readership amongst those media sources that are engaged in fact checking, that are more credible than some of the other sources that you cited. You know, again, I mean, I hate to sound so cliched and make our role as college professors seem so important, but I think it starts with education. The classroom is one place to start. Maybe how to read social media a little bit more critically and skeptically. I mean, I know that's going on in the classes. Um, one of my concerns, and I'm usually an optimistic guy, I don't know why I'm having all these down. <laughs> By the time you catch up with where the social media is and you're educating, it seems that social media has already then taken the next step and we can't kind of keep up 
with it in terms of in the classroom, if that makes any sense. It, um, it, it does. Let me ask one follow-up question. The Boston Globe, the New York Times, they had to set up paywalls. That's the economics. So it's harder for you know, people that are curious or people that you know, just want to see what's this left, you know, left wing media saying. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm just parroting other people's words. But I got a paywall. You got to have more people reading it. But I got a paywall. <coughs> yeah. Journalism is, is, is expensive. And uh, I totally get it. It's expensive. We, you know, we want subscribers. Um, and subscribers will get informed, you know, news stories and op uh, opinion columns and editorials. Um, we can't give it away for free. Um, there's, you know, it depends the way the meter is. Um, but I think people would pay for good journalism. The people will pay for good journalism not the 48 percent necessarily <laughs> they look they don't have to read the globe they, they're as i said i think there are ways to again it's hard with all the social with all the social media and all the websites we don't quite know how to figure out how to get a conversation about you know democracy and free press but we but there's got to be ways for people to look at whatever website they're on whatever feed they're on to say, well, why don't I try to get, is this fake news or you know, let me dig down a little bit. Um, it would be great if people could say, let me try something, let me see what the opposite viewpoint is and go look for that. Um, we have to kind of figure out how to engage those people. This reminds me of a, a, a Ford Hall forum uh, we had uh, last April. We, uh, Arlie Hochschild, who's an acclaimed sociologist at the University of, um, uh, at Berkeley, um, talked about her book, Strangers in Their Own Land, Fear and Mourning on the American Right. Um, and she was really intrigued about the uh, emergence of the Tea Party. And she left the liberal bubble of Berkeley to go to Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is the most conservative parish in Louisiana in a very conservative state, um, trying to understand this. And she talked about, um, and she spent four years down in Lake Charles uh, researching her book, um, visited, I think she said, hundreds of homes. And when she went, went in the homes, um, and these were not people of means, she said she didn't see a book in sight. Um, there were huge, large screen television sets in every room, and Fox News was playing on every television. Um, and that w went. That was the case with all of her neighbors. So that was the sole source of news um, for uh, the folks with whom she had contact over the years. I think, though. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that is. I think part of the part of the criticism of the liberal press is that we we don't validate what people think, you know, we go in and say, oh, they're Fox News. So we make all these judgments against them without kind of digging down that they're real people. They, mm -hmm. they have the same mm -hmm. um, concerns that other people mm -hmm. do. So I think there's a tendency to kind of put everybody in these little buckets um, and not, not dig down and say they're mm -hmm. fellow human beings mm -hmm. with uh, that would probably have a lot of common ground. We just have to find it. Yeah. I think Arlie, I, she absolutely believed that, yeah. and she talked about climbing the empathy wall um, and really having a deeper understanding of the lives of the men and women um, she met. And I think she had respect and, you know, lifted them up. Didn't necessarily mm -hmm. agree with their views, but mm -hmm. um, she spoke a number of times about uh, crossing that empathy wall and trying to uh, better understand and open lines of communication with mm -hmm. these. Uh, with the folks with whom she met. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Um, can you step up to the uh, microphone, sir? And, oh goodness. Uh, this has to do with the West Covington issue. You know, the boy in uh, D.C. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was initially a great deal of uh, hostility to the boy that he was intimidating uh, uh, the Native American. And then there was a second story, a back story coming back that he was trying to protect him. And my question to you is, I, I'm a very active reader. I mean, I get the Wall Street Journal every day, I read The Economist, 
You got all of these email news feeds, you know, from the post and from, I still don't know what's real. I don't know who to read, because obviously somebody came out and, <clears throat> and uh, victimized, not victimized, but, but you know, criticized him that he was intimidating. And then, then there was another story, you know, flow a couple days later that went in the other direction. Whereas a consumer of information, does somebody get something that comes close to reality or, tr or the truth, if we can, if we can talk about truth? Sure, that, that was a uh, fluid story for a few days. And I think yeah. when all these um, videos came out, the, the story changed. Um, so it's, you know, you have to kind of look at the videos, um, but it's also um, interesting that the, you know, the, the first day story was very, very alarming. The second day story said, so, well, maybe that didn't happen. And um, I agree, I'm not quite sure what happened still. I mean, it's a, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot going on to unpack on that, in that episode. You have a question? Hi, um, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if um, your First Amendment as a journalist has ever been restricted if you've ever, if someone has ever tried to silence you when you were reporting or writing a story, um, in that, and that includes the Boston Globe. Me personally? Yeah. No. Do you know anyone who might have been, or have, have might have been tried to be silenced for something they were reporting on? Uh, I'm sure there are people at the Globe who have been, you know, probably been tried to be silenced, but I just don't know, I don't know, I don't know of them, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that we did do was with, the, with uh, this man from California who tried to intimidate us, but didn't silence us. Could you um, give us a little bit more details on that intimidation that happened? They, he, he made threatening phone calls to us and with death threats, um, so we, we had a police presence, um, and he was arrested a couple of weeks later in California. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I follow? Mm -hmm. I, I think we're at the point right now where the First Amendment, I mean, I don't think, it, you know, as I was saying in my comments, it doesn't go back nearly as far as I think we as Americans like to think. But I think right now the First Amendment protections are, are fairly rigorous. I mean, you've never had an experience where you felt your First Amendment rights have, have been violated. I think that's what makes this rhetoric that's going on right now so scary. The threat isn't necessarily from the government, I don't see, uh, impinging on First Amendment rights. The threat is when you create such a toxic environment that A, it could potentially lead to violence, or B, people just don't trust what's in the media, right? So that the threat is, um, you know, I, I studied censorship. It's very, very scary when a government tries to crack down on media and imposes rules and puts journalists in jail and threatens to kill them from the government. I think what we have going on here is we're pretty good in terms of the government is not targeting right. you, the government is not trying to restrict you, but creating this toxic environment where no one believes the media because it's all a bunch of lies. And Trump admits it. You know, he, you know, he admitted to like himself. <coughs> That's what he's trying to do create something so that it's a negative story, it's fake news. So that's not like a, an infringement on the First Amendment, but in some ways it's really scary because if we don't have a kind of common base of reality as citizens, uh, the threat isn't coming from the government, but how do we engage in rational discourse and dialogue when we have such a toxic civic discourse where people aren't even working from the same set of facts? Like that's like profoundly scary to me as Absolutely. a citizen. Other questions? Come up. Hello. Um, so I'm, I'm from South Africa, and um, you know the press played a, a huge role in uh, ending apartheid in South Africa. But you know what I feel is that we use that to educate the world on what was going on um, as an intervention. Um, my question, or what I'd like to hear your thoughts on, is um, I know personally I don't. I try and avoid the news now because it uh, it makes me nervous. Um, 
I feel like now it instills fear um, in terms of what's going on. So my, my uh, question is, how do you think we can reverse that where we start as society to help journalists um, in terms of you know, educating ourselves, uh, receiving those news where they're well received and we can educate ourselves and um, really do something about it, um, take action, um, rather than just either avoiding the news uh, because we feel that it's, you know, it instills fear, um, it makes us nervous in terms of what's happening. It's valid news, um, it's things that we should know what's going on, but um, sometimes we receive the news and we don't do anything about it, and the whole point of this is to be educated and to um, take action. So, so can I put the question back to you just to make sure I understand? You, why is it that you avoid the news? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, so, I mean, journalists, um, you're doing a really great job in terms of, uh, you know, putting out there what is going on ar around the world, but as society, as society, what can we do um, to, to educate ourselves or re reverse those roles where we take action? Subscribe to the Boston yeah. Globe. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are there are several stories on, on any given day, um, so you could find out what's happening in the what's happening in the news. Um, I know that it makes you a little bit nervous. There are also incredible stories from all sorts of news organizations about people, about you know trying to fight climate change, uh, about any host of of subjects that people should feel passionate about, or at least they can find out, you know, if it, if it interests them, they can find out so much information on that. Um, so there's a lot of, you, you know, if, if the actual daily news makes you crazy, there's, the, there's a kaleidoscope of beautiful stories mm -hmm. in, in publications. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Um, so, you mentioned earlier how the media itself isn't really under threat from the government, per se, for being censored. It's more of sort of like a, a social problem that we all have, which is causing distrust in the media because we're sort of getting like bombarded with all of this stuff that's sort of happening. And um, it kind of sparked a question in my mind because lately all of the um, democratic backsliding sort of stuff that we're seeing is um, a lot less violent as it used to be. It's not quite as like force. It's, it's a little bit more organic where people are taking up these populist movements and gaining recognition from actual legitimate political parties and getting into office, say Donald Trump. You know, if he were so violent and horrible, like he wouldn't have necessarily gotten in, but it was a lot more organic in this country for someone like him to actually come up. Um, with that said, obviously there's a lot of um, sort of like gatekeeping that political parties use to keep these horrible people, like demagogues, what have you, out of office, out of power. And I'm seeing like sort of a correlation with um, news outlets and how there are these news outlets out there who are not quite reporting um, the real story. They're very like hard left or hard right and sort of doing their own sort of thing and just spewing information that's like wishy-washy. Um, what kind of like gatekeeping does the media do to keep out these very whacked out stories of things that are supposedly happening, say like BuzzFeed is like super hard left, and I don't necessarily trust that they're completely neutral. What sort of gatekeeping can you guys do in the media as like say a Boston Globe journalist to be able to discredit the dangerous parts of the media so that we're actually getting the real, as neutral as possible story? Well, I think you know, if I'm understanding your, your question correctly, I think this gets back to a point that you made previously in terms of people understanding the different parts of the newspaper and how they work. The editorial page is supposed to present opinions, 
But the news coverage, the facts and so forth, that's, you know, there's no political uh, orientation to that whatsoever. So when you're talking about gatekeeping, I'm not entirely, I mean, I, I see what the main, you know, what newspapers like the Boston Globe, Washington Post, New York Times are doing outside of the editorial section is they're just reporting the facts. Um, I don't think there's a conscious effort to kind of be a gatekeeper of sorts. No. Yes, you're just reporting what's going on. Yeah, and, and these publications, I mean, they, they're going to put out, you know, whatever they, whatever, whether it's left or right, they're going to put out what they want. It's, um, it's up to the individual reader and user to figure out whether this is correct information. Um, because there's so much out there. You can, you, can, you can pick and choose anything you want, but you kind of have to, as I said earlier, you have to dig down one or two you know, levels to make sure that this is legitimate. Um, nobody's a gatekeeper, nobody could do that. It's, there's just <coughs> so, much, so much out there, it just bombards you. I mean, I'm sure if you look at your news feed, it's, no, it's <laughs> coming at you. So um, you can find anything you want, but you don't know, you need to make sure that it's legitimate. Do you think once the Trump administration ends, there will be like a regulation back in uh, media and journalism? Or has like the mix of the Trump administration and social media just changed the journalism field forever? I don't know if it was Trump. I would say social media has changed it. I mean, Trump tapped into it, but it was not Trump. So I think this is a journey and a process that the media has to figure out mm -hmm. on how, how to navigate it and how we're kind of at a big crossroads here on how we can um, kind of get back to, you know, make sure that we have some, that people respect the facts, first of all. But I don't think it has to do with Trump. I think that's the genie's out of the bottle on that one. Great. I also want to thank you both for being here. Marjorie, I remember when I first saw the, um, the effort, the editorial effort on the, on the website, I was so impressed and the numbers grew as far as how many publications were participating and it was, a, it was a really good feeling. But at the same time, there were some larger publications that opted not to play along, if you will, and I think it sparked a bit of a debate within the journalistic community and the public at large about whether you know, media was sort of following the leader and I think some of the, some certain publications may have agreed with the effort but said we speak with our own voice and I'm wondering if you had a reaction to that and, and if you responded to anybody who may have brought up, you know, should 400 some odd publications all be joining an effort that some could argue suggests that they're, they really are all working together. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember that uh, concern um, <coughs> which would have been different if it was one, one editorial that everybody was writing. But it was, each publication wrote their own editorials about what freedom of the press meant to that community. Um, and as far as the big ones went, we had some big ones, we didn't have, and other ones didn't. It wasn't about who was in and who was out, it was a matter for each individual publication to decide whether they wanted to join. Um, and it was very heartening to see the smaller newspapers and the smaller publications join. They have the most to lose. I mean, the bigger publications can take a hit, but I mean, I don't know if, if a publication in a small rural area that uh, is conservative and they were standing up for the free press, I certainly hope their advertisers would honor that, but I don't know if they did. Um, so I thought it was a very organic and, and, and very transparent process when we went through it. I think we have time for one more question. So I kind of want to add on to that. Marty Barron said we're not at war, we're at work. <laughs> and I wanted to get your comments about um, how you feel about media making themselves a story, which I think a lot of people may have thought was part of what was going on with this coordinated op-ed. Uh, yes, were we a story? We, we were absolutely a story. But we were also sticking up for ourselves. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think uh, we're, you know, we're hammered as the fake news and you know, every journalist that I know, they get up every morning trying to 
you know, get the facts, make sure everything is accurate, mm -hmm. check it again. Um, so I think to stand up in solidarity for an institution that we value, that we, you know, wake up every day trying to make it right and trying to inform readers, um, I think I think that was okay. Can I just add yeah. Uh, is, up, that up, you have to cut, go to the microphone. Isn't that then part potentially of the answer to your question about the way forward? Right? That that's information that people who may not trust the institution should know. Journalists get up, they work hard every day, and the ethics there, the, the gatekeeping that Gabe talked about, is about producing truthful articles. Well, as you said, we were, we, we were part of that story. I hope that everybody who raises the concerns that you have um, actually read the editorials, because it goes right to what you're saying. Um, uh, the, the, you should take the time to read them. They're, they're, they're amazing, mm -hmm. and they're just committed people every day. So I think that's how we get the story out by having, you know, people sit down and read them. Brian and Marjorie, I'd like to thank you again so very much. Thank you. Um, oh, this is for the real.